Hello and welcome to this LGA virtual conference about the future of adult social care. If we'd have had a crystal ball, we couldn't have planned it for a better day for this with all the speculation that you've no doubt seen in the media uh, about what the government may or may not do. And perhaps later the minister might care to comment on uh, that. The minister will be taking questions early and what we'll be doing through the whole of this is asking you to put uh, questions to us on chat so that the LGA staff can forward them to me and we can try and bring them together into bite-sized chunks for all the questioners uh, to deal with. But in the first instance, if you could bring forward your uh, question to the Minister while uh, we're speaking. Uh, if I'd have been meeting you today, I might actually have brought you a third birthday cake because this is actually the third anniversary of us not getting the green paper on adult social care that we were promised in July 2017. It would have been a bit more complicated if I'd got you a birthday cake for the other three occasions where the government has missed its own deadlines. Uh, and it's also perhaps we would have been able to celebrate the fact that the government had uh, an intensive review and scenario planning for a pandemic uh, but then certainly left out the bits of it which applied to adult social care. So before we introduce the Minister, who seems to be speeding towards somewhere uh, at, at the moment, uh, I'd like to take you on a little magical mystery tour, because as you might know, I'm speaking to you today from Liverpool. If I took you a hundred yards to the left of my house, you'd be on the most famous lane in the world, Penny Lane. If you walked down it for just five minutes, you would find a residential care home where in March, 17 of their residents died within four days. And that would be normally the number they would expect to see die in nine to 10 months. There was no PPE. There was no advice to the manager of that centre and the organisation that stepped in to make sure there was staff, that there was PPE and that there was support to the management was in fact the local authority, although supported of course by the NHS. I was in there yesterday, it's a very good uh, centre, uh, but it's got another problem that it's about to lose a member of staff to the NHS which pays something between 10 and 15% more for similar amounts of work, which suggests to me that the system just doesn't join up at all. We could then walk down Allerton Road and we'd see all sorts of charity shops there, which should remind us that a lot of the work that's done to deal with the elderly actually takes place in the voluntary and community sector. And they do absolutely vital work alongside the council in keeping people as well as possible for as long as possible. Because although we can't stop the aging process, we can try and keep people healthy, which means that they're not so affected in, uh, as, as they approach their old age uh, and retirement uh, and longer. And it would also remind us that everyone's been talking about the pressures on adult social care caused by the increasing number of people like me, I'm of retirement age, who are getting old. But one of the key pressures are people who join the adult social care at the age of 18, who will live almost normal lifespans. They would previously have died uh, at birth, if not very early in life, but we will be caring for them for 40 or 50 years. And the voluntary and community sector plays such a heavy role in, in dealing with that. And then we'd end up at Allerton Library and Calderstones Park. The library, one of the most popular in uh, Liverpool, outside the city centre, used heavily by people as a form of relaxation, as a place to meet. And you'd go up to Calderstones Park, past, just to carry on the Beatles connection, the school that used to be known as Quarry Bank School, where the quarry men started, who were of course 
opera Picasso to the Beatles. And you would see all sorts of things on a good day in normal times going on in that park to pe keep people fit and healthy. And you would see a building there called the Mansion House, which is run by a community interest company called the Reader Organization, which uses uh, the power of reading and pulling people together to keep people in good physical and mental health. And those three examples will perhaps serve to show you that in fact the services that are needed to keep people healthy through their life are very complex ones. Many of them are outside the NHS and uh, many of them are under threat with local authorities in England still facing something like a five billion pound deficit which is putting many of our non-statutory services under threat and then lastly you could come back to my house for a cup of tea but just perhaps for a reminder of the point of the part that councillors and councillors play in making all this work i sit here as a member in my ward looking after fifteen thousand people doing some of the low level coordination while the elected mayor of Liverpool and our strategic officers work together in the centre to pull it all together for the whole of the city. And all those things are contained in the seven principles that we're announcing today, uh, our fourth publication while we're still waiting for the government's first green paper. And I think James from the ADAS will be telling you more about them but it's a whole system approach to this. It's local led and local controlled. It's the voluntary and community sector working alongside the public and private sectors. It's dealing with people as individuals rather than numbers as we help them through their life's journey. So those are the sorts of things that 32 organizations, including the LGA from the public, private and voluntary sectors have come together today to say this is the way forward. So that when Boris Johnson, Minister Waitley make their decisions, they will do so hopefully with the information of those of us who deliver the services day in and day out. So just a reminder that uh, if you have any questions for the minister and then subsequently for anyone, please, uh, put them on the chat column so they can be forwarded uh, to me, the, the Q&A column, so that I can deal with them. Uh, and having said that, uh, Minister, as I say, I've never done a Zoom meeting with someone in a car before, so you're definitely a first. Uh, over to you to uh, perhaps reveal what you couldn't reveal on Radio 4 or Sky, uh, was it Sky or LBC today? Uh, but uh, tell us what you can. Thank you very much, Minister. But you need to unmute, unmute your screen, and which you've now okay. done. Can you hear me okay? Right, I'm just... I tried to also dial in over the telephone because I thought the sound would be a bit better, but that doesn't seem to have worked. But it seems like you can hear me okay on the um, iPad that I'm using, more or less. Yes, my apologies, I don't have headphones um, for it. Uh, uh, so it's very good to join you uh, today. And I'd say that uh, this conversation to me very much builds on the huge number of conversations that I've had over recent months uh, with James Bullion and with Simon Williams uh, and with others uh, representing uh, and involved in local authorities, whether that's directors of adult social services uh, and uh, chief executives and council leaders as well. And I am well aware of the very important role local authorities have been playing in the COVID response and all the work that's been going on between um, local authorities and the social care sector. Uh, and you know, that's really been brought to life very much in recent weeks where we've seen the situations in places like Leicester where um, 
we in the department have worked really closely with both directors of public health and directors of adult social services on making sure that there is all possible support that there can be to the care homes particularly uh, in the light of a situation where you've got a community a local community outbreak of covid and what i think i hope those involved in those responses would agree with this is that we can all say that we have learned a huge amount over recent months and that now we are in so much more of a stronger position of knowing what it is that you need to do in order to keep residents, particularly care homes, safe in the event that there is COVID circulating in the community. We have the testing infrastructure in place so that we can get rapid access to extra testing when the risks go up. Uh, we have the PPE supplies in place. Uh, we have the connections being made between health and social care. Um, so altogether, uh, the outcome of, you know, weeks and months of hard work to get ourselves into a much more resilient place. But I think what we can all agree is that we know that we started out this pandemic with social care in a fragile situation and that we all know that reform of social care is overdue and we all know that you know, there is a fundamental challenge for funding um, and the you know, level quite simply a level of funding that goes into social care across the country. Uh, and there are also some real challenges for the workforce which are connected to that. So I'll say that you know, hand in hand with the ongoing work on COVID, the preparations for winter, which I know we um, must be and are working closely with local authorities on, we're also moving ahead with work on social care reform. Again, which we need to do hand in hand with yourselves, with local authorities, and with the providers themselves. But I'd like to talk about three areas in which we're particularly looking. Um, first is workforce, then on funding, and then on integration. Um, so you know, coming to workforce, we know that the care workforce has been genuinely at the front line in the pandemic. And just as we have clapped NHS workers, we have rightly clapped care workers. Uh, and no, very sadly, we have also lost social care workers. And I'd say now is a moment to actually pay tribute to the 257 care workers uh, that we know whose lives have been lost during the pandemic. Um, and no, I think we owe it to them as much as the rest of the workforce to make sure that we do better by the social care workforce in future. What I will say is I also want us to use the moment of the pandemic and the, I guess, the light that that has shone on social care uh, and, and the awareness that it's given people of social care as a real moment to recognise the care workforce, to recognise uh, the values, the compassion, the dedication of those members of a workforce uh, and to make sure that when we recognise those at the NHS, we should absolutely absolutely and equally recognise those in social care. So in our reform strategy, I want to make sure that the workforce is right at the heart of that strategy, looking at how we recognise uh, the skills of the workforce, looking at how we reward the workforce, um, and looking at how we make sure that social care is a, 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 a real career opportunity for people who are looking to work across health uh, and, uh, and, and, and social care and, 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 and looking at people looking for a good job that social care will be a place to look uh, for that but I know absolutely that in part what we need to do for the workforce is very much related to the second area of reform and the funding situation and we have to both make sure that the quantum of money going into social care is sufficient so that we are paying our workforce well enough so that we have the standard and access to care that we would all expect in a society like our own and we also need to address the uh, fairness of the funding of social care and the question of who pays recognizing that at the moment that while an average person spends about forty thousand pounds on their care 
that around one in 10 spend over a hundred thousand pounds on their care and that for some the costs of that care can be absolutely catastrophic and also the way that the funding works means that um, there is very little sort of protection you can't ensure yourself there's no pooling of the risk uh, so there's very little you can do actually to prepare um, to cope with that kind of cost that may hit you um, so we need to address both those parts of the, the question uh, and I also want to do so in a way that builds a consensus across parties across uh, the sector on the way forwards on this because we really want such ambitious reforms to stand the test of time and then thirdly on integration and I would say that integration to be a bit careful because sometimes it's an overused word but I do want us to make sure that we actually draw on what has at times really worked uh, in uh, the pandemic where we have seen and it's definitely better in some areas than others the really effective working together of the NHS, of local authorities, um, and of social care providers. Look at where it really works and make sure that that is genuinely uh, something that happens across the whole country, uh, that we have the true joining up of these services around individuals so that people get the care that ultimately that they want. And so that services are absolutely created to meet people's needs, not just what the system happens to do. And as I say, in the conversations that are already going on, about reform, we are already seeing some really great examples of this kind of stuff happening. And sometimes it's not looking about sort of inventing something from scratch, it's making sure that, uh, that everybody is uh, doing what the best do. And I say that recognizing that we'll also have variation across the country, it's not one size fits all, but that I think across the country we can without doubt do better. And that's where I want to get to uh, with the, the far reaching reforms that we. We plan to do over the the months ahead. Uh, now I'm pausing because I've noticed that I've I've just come off the uh, uh, off the motorway and I may lose a bit of reception. I was trying to fit this into the the, the, the bit of the day where I knew that the coverage would be good. And I know you uh, may have some questions, so I will do my absolute best to answer them. But forgive me if uh, if it goes a bit fuzzy. I'll just I'll just have to do my, my best. Fine, thank you very much uh, for that, Minister. You look to be going through a wood the whole time. It looks very attractive from what was going past you. So thank you. For that. <laughs> That's so we're my beginning. Good we're beginning to get a, a, a few uh, questions in. Um, in a way, you've covered some of them, uh, but uh, one of the problems that we have is that there has not been, until we clapped together for both sectors a parity of esteem between the NHS and social care, where social care has been very much seen as the, the last resort, the, 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 the people that get the money last, the resources last, and in fact, as I said before, often pinching uh, staff from the social care sector into the NHS. What are you going to do to help promote the parity of esteem between the two sectors? Um, I would say that's absolutely something that you know, I want to do, I am doing, I have been doing. Uh, I'd say we've already made some progress where there was a point at which it was a success that we got, uh, we heard the Prime Minister talking in the same breath about health and social care workforce. The Queen talked about the social care workforce. I would say that the narrative, at least people talking about it, has changed. Um, there is work to do to deliver it on in policy terms. Actually something I'd say for instance that we've seen in COVID is on testing. Uh, that you know, we've worked really hard to get access to testing to come to social care workers at the same time as NHS workers wherever possible. There's some logistical challenges because sometimes if you've got NHS staff working in a hospital they can just do the tests on site. That's just a very but at no, every opportunity to uh, think about the workforce as a joint work. Thank you. Um, as you can tell, I'm an old bloke. And one of the things that upsets me most is that we're always seeing the old people as being a problem. Yet if I go down Allerton Road, which I mentioned before, every charity shop is full of people my age. The school governors are full of people my age. I see mum, grandmas and grandpas pushing their grandchildren around so their children go to work. Do we need to flip this idea of old people being a problem, both individually for people 
uh, like me who want to contribute still, uh, but also the fact that caring for elderly people is becoming a place where we could take a lead uh, commercially, inventing new products, inventing new processes. So the whole of the aging process, both commercially and individually, could be a positive thing, not the negative way it's usually presented. I, I mean, I think I, I completely agree. I, I, I'm, I'm with you that we should see uh, people of all ages uh, in life making a positive contribution to society. Um, and I think it's probably, you no, know, it's a bigger question than social specifically is to make sure that as a society you know, people of different societies have different cultures here uh, it's what is one we need to grapple with our in our own culture um, but I, I i can but agree that that is a more positively I think we are having difficulty I'll hearing you properly. The contribution now. that they, they ah. provide, and I'm also well aware yeah. that you know, many, many, many of our patients care as an unpaid carers are indeed all. I think, uh, uh, unless I'm the only one having problem, I think we're all having difficulty hearing the Minister. Now we are. So, Minister, I'd like to thank you, if you can hear this, uh, for joining us uh, today. Uh, being in the ca car has meant you've been able to dodge oh, the nasty... A huge amount of... The end. Uh, okay, I'm in a rather patchy rural bit, it's true. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for joining us today, uh, Minister. As I'm, that any better? I'm still gone. I can assure you we'll all be in touch uh, I can with you try. over the coming If I stop the video, is that any better? Uh, not really, no. Uh, speak to me, Minister. No, uh, I think... I'm going to have to be rude and take you on. Ah, well, you're back now. I can see well, you yes. anyway. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so you must have lost me for that bit. But I, I yes. heard your, your thank you. So I, I, I'm, thank you for that. And my, and my apologies that the reception uh, in my rural bit of Kent isn't, isn't what it might be. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so so uh, my final comment was. I can assure you, you haven't heard from the last of us. Every one of us will be in touch with you to make sure you're doing the right things over the next few months. So thank you for joining us very much today, Minister. Great. Thank you very much. Speak to you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Right. Uh, so uh, I think we've got Anna just in one place. Uh, so Anna, can I immediately turn to you? Thank you. Thank you and um, good afternoon. Thank you for having me speak to you today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Anna Severite and um, I'm the co-chair of the Coalition for Collaborative Care and also part of the Social Care Futures uh, movement. But I'm here today speaking to you um, because I'm someone that uses both health and social care. I have uh, lots of long-term conditions and in my early 20s I became more uh, disabled, needing to use an electric wheelchair and had to sort of reluctantly accept that perhaps I needed some social care support and um, initially that was a real relief. I was able to have a shower again and my flat was cleaner and things like that um, but after a while I really realised that I was surviving and not really living a normal life and also my experience with social care which I know a lot of my friends have also felt is that often it's quite a fight between us and them which is a real shame because I think it should be much more of a partnership and that sense of trying to get what you need um, can often feel like a battle and quite scary for people. Uh, my personal experience in Covid I think has been like many people um, quite difficult, I've been stuck indoors a lot, um, I live in a flat so I've, I've only been outside a few times but I know other people who've got relatives with dementia who are worried that they won't remember them uh, after they uh, come out of lockdown and obviously we heard earlier from 
uh, Councillor Kemp about care homes and the difficulties they've experienced. I think personally I felt quite abandoned by the system. I've been in hospital for not for COVID, um, but I've not heard anything from social care apart from two um, generic letters. And that sense of no real support or knowing where to go to for help has, I think, been quite common experience. I would like to say though, um, to all the people that are involved today, thank you for all the hard work you have put in during COVID. I acknowledge it's been a really difficult time, uh, totally, as everyone says, unprecedented. And, um, and people have been working really hard to try and do their best. So I just wanted to say that at this point. But I'm just going to share my screen. I think we've all agree that reform is needed in um, social care and um, long overdue. And so I want to just talk more about, instead of talking about my experience of COVID, but talk about what we've learned and where I think reform, what's needed. So this here really sums up for me what I think adult social care should be all about. I think we should all deserve and all have the right to live a good and an ordinary life. That's what I want. I want to be like my friends, just living a normal life, whatever that is. And it will be different for absolutely everyone. And I think that everybody should be able to do that, regardless of our age, regardless if you have a learning disability, regardless if you have a physical disability. Actually, we all just want to be getting on with our lives and doing the things that we enjoy and that matter to us. And I think everyone deserves um, to be treated as people with respect and not really as objects that need to be solved and problems that need to be sort of looked after, but that actually we have gifts and potentials and potential to give to society as well. And I think one of the things that COVID has really shown me is this word vulnerable that seems to have been banded about everywhere. Um, the government love it, media love it, um, even social care have, have it's, it's become a very popular common word and actually we can all be vulnerable in different stages of our lives and at different times in life and just labeling people in this one big group it kind of makes it a problem over there for other people and dehumanizes us and i would like to say that i think social care should fight against that sense of labeling people in that way the other thing covid's really shown me is about inequalities um we knew they were there. We knew that people with learning disabilities had a shorter life expectancy. We knew that poverty expect, um, reduces your life expectancy and how well you are during your life. We knew that ethnic minorities often suffered um, in the same way. But I think COVID has really shone a big light on that. And any reform really needs to be tackling that head on. And I think social care has a really important role um, in that. So what needs to happen? What do I think needs to happen? for us to realise this vision, if indeed that's what we should be aiming for. Obviously funding, it's been mentioned already. Um, I'm not going to go into what I think the funding model is, um, but I do think it needs to be fair for all. And then the next thing I think for me is that society needs to see social care as an asset that we all own. You know, I think there's that, as everyone's mentioned, the NHS, it gets that love. Everyone talks about how wonderful the NHS is. And I think the problem with social care is it's often seen as it's something that other people need um, and people don't feel ownership of it. And actually we need to rewrite the story of social care and we need to tell people that actually social care is about all of us, all of society. As was already mentioned, you know, there are a lot of jobs in social care and social care itself needs to promote itself as this opportunity that actually if it's well funded, it creates jobs and that's good for everyone. It allows people like me to contribute to society and as was mentioned earlier, people of all ages and all abilities have things to offer. Um, I've regularly have to turn down opportunities to volunteer or to work because I don't have enough PA hours to support me during that opportunity. And actually, I could be doing a lot more if I had more support. It makes our communities a much richer place to live. And also for the people that need care in whatever form, I think it improves our well-being. It should reduce our isolation and that improves our mental health and keeps us all happier which i think is an important thing actually that we often overlook i think the well-being principle in the care act is brilliant but i wouldn't say that at the moment my well-being is being met um, by my care another thing i think reform needs as the minister mentioned which she called it integration i would just call it joined up working that looks at my whole life i don't think we need one ginormous system because actually the nhs is a huge system and people don't talk to each other within that so Bringing social care in and losing the culture, I don't think would necessarily help. But I do think we need to get to a point where people are not saying that's their problem, that's a different department, that's a different person's job, but they are all focused on 
one joint goal and that joint goal should be me living my life how I want to be and having a good life and well-being and this sums summed up for me in the fact that for example I'm not allowed to use my PA hours um, to collect a prescription because apparently that's a health need so how am I meant to get prescriptions I'm not entirely sure and and that just seems bonkers because that's not helping anybody it's not helping my health it's not helping my well-being and it certainly doesn't seem to me to be looking at me as a whole person I also think that needs to include things like housing and benefits because I can't separate the different parts of my life but the system insists on trying to do so Another thing is that people need genuine choice and control. As soon as you enter the social care system, a lot of your autonomy is removed from you and you are sort of split up, or I was anyway, split up into a series of tasks. How much time to have a shower? How much time do I need to do food preparation to clean my flat? And that's very dehumanizing and not how most people live their lives. Um, it also often feels like sort of it's the least possible to just keep you safe. We need to really knowledge that actually we are individuals and we will all want to do different things we will want some flexibility in our lives and that's perfectly normal we need some good alternatives to things like care homes so that people have got that genuine choice and it's not just the default there are good examples out there but often um, they're very small and then they get sucked into the system and they lose what made them really good and innovative in the first place we need some flexibility and I think COVID has shown us actually that systems can change and can be really different and we need to embrace that and not be scared of that. For me there's something also about power and trust. Um, I get letters that have threats in bold that if I do not return this form within 21 days my direct payment might stop which is very scary and doesn't breed a sense of being in partnership with my local authority, it breeds a sense of fear and that they hold all the power. And actually, I want them to trust me as an individual that I know what's best for my life and to be able to um, use my direct payment in a way that best suits my needs. I also think that's the same with communities. We need to trust the communities and enable them to um, give them permission to actually do things like we've seen with the mutual aid organisations. Where that's really flourished has been where they've had the freedom to work in the way that works best for their communities. And then I think we could build some really good relationships between the people that use social care, between communities and between um, social care and the rest of local government. And for genuine reform to work, and I think we need to be ambitious here, I think we need to think big. I don't think we just tweak around the edges because it's not been working. I don't want to be here in 10 years time saying exactly the same things that I've been saying for the last five years. <laughs> um, but we do need to work with communities and citizens to make this change. It won't work if you don't involve us because actually we are the ones that are living it and we have brilliant ideas and we know what works for us and what doesn't work. And it disappointed me that actually the minister mentioned working with various people, but at no point did she mention talking to people with lived experience or their carers and unpaid carers. So um, that's what I wanted to say today. So thank you for uh, listening to me. Anna, thank you very much indeed for grounding us so effectively in the realities of life. It's easy to talk about billions here and billions there and structures. At the end of the day, if we're not meeting the needs of you and your peers, then there's no point in any of us doing all that much. So uh, having heard from uh, uh, someone with living experience of this, let's move over to James Bullion, the president of uh, ADAS. I, yeah. Turn myself off mute and turn my camera on. Hello, everybody. Um, sorry about that. Um, hopefully, you can see a shared screen with some slides on it. Um, good. And um, hi, I'm the James Bullion, President of ADAS. Thank you very much. Um, I'd, I'd like to first uh, start with uh, thanks to the minister for uh, sharing. Um, the areas of uh, concentration um, and particularly for the statements that she made around value in social care and, and the learning about the need to do that and the need um, to address the funding and the integration uh, position uh, and to uh, Anna too for um, another really good uh, a hard act to follow uh, with her description of what needs to change around social care M much of which I think the values and the principles um, uh, launched today try to uh, uh, address 
Um, uh, ADAS represents directors of adult social services around uh, the country. And um, my list of the challenges today echo what everyone else has said around uh, a short-term approach to uh, social care, fragile markets, the, the, the challenge of a fantastic growth in demography, which is a really positive, uh, both in terms of younger people uh, living with disability or, and older people living longer lives. Um, but on, on the flip side of that, uh, the growing levels of unmet need and the insufficiency of resources uh, to address those needs and the problems uh, well known around the workforce. Um, without rehearsing too much of the history, um, social care budgets have, have reduced over the past 10 years and would have reduced further this year actually, but for the intervention of the pandemic. Uh, and now local authorities uh, have a, a three-pronged problem really. We have an immediate financial problem we have the, the COVID itself and planning for the winter, and we have the conundrum and problem of uh, reform going forwards. Um, so we're in a position today where the recent ADAS survey uh, outlined that whereas most directors uh, were either partially or fully confident they could meet their duties last year, this year it really has been a, a real change where many directors of adult social services can't begin to do the basics, let alone, let alone the ordinary uh, aspirational messages that Anna uh, Severite was just uh, giving us. So we are in a, a, a poor state, but uh, COVID-19, I think, um, to echo um, what, what the Minister was saying and what Anna uh, has been saying, um, COVID-19 has, has um, highlighted the true value of adult, adult social care, both to the public, but also, I, I hope, um, has highlighted the value of social work, and in particular, the ability that we have to safeguard people and to work with people who are in a, a vulnerable position if not vulnerable uh, people all of the time um, and it's really showcased the skill and compassion and the dedication of care staff and actually the innovation of people who are uh, directing their own care with their PAs to adapt uh, to a challenging situation. I think it's highlighted too that councils are the right home for adult social care uh, and, and just to reflect on some of the things that Anna Severite was saying, too often social care is interpreted as personal care rather than living a good life and living well and the wider uh, aspects of that, including uh, housing and so on. Um, and, but, but also uh, COVID-19 has magnified and exposed the challenges and really stressed uh, the existing challenges. Um, one of those has been around the NHS and social care relationships where nationally there's been too much emphasis on protecting the NHS and in particular dealing with discharges to care homes uh, at the beginning of COVID-19. Compare that with locally, adult social care and the NHS have, have uh, found a new normal quite quickly uh, and adapted quite quickly if left and given permission uh, to do that. And I really do think that indicates that um, adult social care and uh, primary care uh, in particular and community care have really got to be the way that we look at integrated working. Um, and uh, this slide just demonstrates the areas in which the scarcity of uh, that health relationship has proved a problem. So there are significant problems with getting care in care homes, but also significant problems in getting access to substance misuse and mental health services, uh, particularly, um, you know, particularly for people uh, during the pandemic period it, itself. So what should happen? Well, we have the principles launched by the LGA today and we've nine statements from uh, ADAS, which I won't go through in great detail, but they do uh, overall entail having a conversation, making sure that um, uh, the choices, the political choices as well, faced by the country about whether to fund and what the question of fairness uh, should be in making a, a funding proposal. Um, in particular, trying to uh, really localise our integrated working around individuals rather than taking a uh, national approach to how we do uh, integrated working. Um, we, we in ADAS uh, feel there does need to be a complete review of how care markets operate and what the regulatory uh, arrangements are for those. Um, we, we think we need to take action in social care and we need local authorities to um, take action on health inequalities. And it really should be 
it really should be the core job of an integrated care system to address inequality and the core job of a health and wellbeing board to do the same and to work on uh, both inequality uh, and anti-poverty uh, work. Um, we um, also um, think that uh, we need to concentrate on housing as much as we do about health and care. And housing is central to all of our lives. As lockdown has shown us, uh, your environment is absolutely key to whether you can uh, live a good life and to live well. Um, and particularly the work that councils have done around rough sleeping, or the work that we do around transforming care for, people, for younger people with learning disabilities, um, tells us that housing is, is central if we want to have alternatives to residential and nursing carers, the only option for some uh, more complex uh, situations. Um, workforce strategy I'll, I'll come back to, um, and digital and technology needs to be a much stronger part of the future. So we think all of that means, and the principles of the LGA mean, that you can't just think about this in terms of the Department of Health and Social Care or the Ministry of Housing and Local Government. This needs to be a cross-governmental approach that includes culture and includes business. Because um, really, social care is a huge uh, opportunity for um, economic growth. And one of the reasons for that is the workforce aspect. Um, so we've got 1.6 million jobs in adult social care. It really needs to be closer to 2 million or 2.1 million uh, today. Um, we think you can only do that if we have a, a fair uh, care wage. And we're uh, calling on the workforce. Uh, one of our uh, conversations we want to have with the public and with government is, should there be a fair national care wage? And should it be perhaps attached to a... a a nursing ban so that you get some parity of esteem. Um, and, and one of our uh, thoughts is about um, uh, Agenda for Change Ban 3 for the techni technical uh, people uh, amongst you. But wages alone won't uh, cover it all. We need to have clear career progression for the workforce. So how do we make this a, a reality? Um, we've got to utilize um, public awareness that have been gained during the pandemic but in particular make use of our local councillors and our MPs as people to engage in that cross-party uh, conversation. And we in social care as leaders need to be joined up. And we, but we most particularly must give people a voice. And um, you know, Anna, Anna is a great voice that uh, is often talking about this. We do need to amplify and make a, a thousand Annas as it were, to get this message across and to, uh, and to get it out there. And so I think that that means a new vision, a clear timetable for change. I would have liked the minister to have uh, given us the months in which he's going to do the cross party work and the um, reform work. We feel there needs to be a 10 year attitude uh, towards all of that. Uh, we've got to make this generational, this change. And uh, we feel that the uh, host of the 32 signatories to these principles by the LGA is the way to push uh, a, a unified partnership and to uh, make social care reform a uh, reality. Thank you. James, thank you very much for that. Uh, just say that, of course, at the LGA, we always work cross party and increasingly in local government when it comes to things like coronavirus and adult social care. Most of us work together in our own councils as well. For the last three years, the LGA has tried to bring together the front benches of all the major parties in the House of Commons to look at these issues. We were going to do it privately, quietly, giving support in a very soft and gentle way, uh, but we got absolutely nowhere with that approach. But you've inspired me to make sure that we have another go at it, uh, basically, because you mentioned 10 years. Uh, governments come and go. We've been known about this issue for 30 years, and unless we get a consensus, then we'll simply get political argument the whole time, rather than an agreed way forward. So thank you very much for that, James. Now let's turn to one of our key partners, Ian Turner, from the Care Providers Alliance, but he's the Executive Chair of the Registered Nursing Homes Association.
That's it. You're, you're ready. It would help if I'd unmuted a few seconds earlier. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I, I will let me just amplify who I am. I'm, I'm actually a provider myself. I've been a responsible individual for 300 um, care home beds, both res residential and nursing, for not many months short of 40 years. Um, <clears throat> as well as the chair of the Registered Nursing Home Association, which represents the small single homes rather than the larger groups. Um, in, in sort of thinking about what I might say in this session, I took myself back five months to when this pandemic really started. Um, and I'm conscious of the fact that in those early press conferences, uh, even though we changed the name of the Department of Health to the Department of Health and Social Care, most of the politicians were still talking about the Department of Health or the NHS. Um, I can well remember several days when we spent more time trying to make sure that social care staff were actually nominated as key workers, um, which at the, at the time seemed to be an absolutely uphill battle all the way. Um, certainly we got care staff on the, on the key worker list, but the next fight was to get supermarkets and retailers and other people to accept that social care workers were part of the were part of key workers, and that came down to some very simple things like the fact that we didn't have an NHS or a care badge, uh, they didn't have a, a, a pass. Um, so I think the point I'm making is that we've made significant progress in the last five months in some aspects. Um, ministers and politicians now talk about health and social care, not about the NHS. Uh, or more so about the, the, the former. Uh, but I think that the other danger on that is that because of what's happened, a lot of people talk about social care as being care homes full stop uh, and do not accept the, 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 the breadth of the sector that Anna's quite rightly pointed out earlier on. Housing schemes, you know, extra care housing, you name it, that we've got a very, very diverse sector. Um, I just want to emphasize that, that you picked up a line in, in the publicity for this uh, seminar to say to live the lives they want to lead. Uh, and I 100% uh, um, back that. My own company uses a strap line of enabling in individuals to live as they choose. Uh, and we try and make that the, 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 the guiding principle within which we do everything. <clears throat> Next thing I want to look at is what have we learned over the last five months <clears throat> as providers, that is. Well, we've obviously learned about the virus. We've learned about asymptomatic transmission and, and sustained transmission and all those other phrases. Um, but we've also seen some principles that <clears throat> certainly my staff are work well used to in terms of doing things like barrier nursing. Uh, but they have really struggled to actually contain this virus because of its transmission uh, potential uh, once inside a building. So we cannot simply act, uh, adopt historic practices. We've got to actually look at what else do we need to do. Um, the, the other thing that, that has come up repeatedly, uh, and especially across Easter, was providers felt that they were... Uh, working on their own and had to plow their own furrow and I mean no better example of that was the, than was PPE uh, when we were all as local authorities as providers of whatever we were just trying to get hold of PPE from wherever we could actually get it thankfully that situation has improved significantly um, but what else have we learned well the next one I want to mention has already been mentioned briefly, and that's the fact that data is absolutely crucial to managing a situation like this. And in effect, we set off with nothing. Um, so technology has been wheeled out to do things like GP consultations and online monitoring. Um, but the thing I ask myself is, what on earth would we have done if this had happened 10 years ago before the internet or before the internet was widely available? Um, we also know a couple of other things, and, and I'm mainly saying this because I actually manage a website called Digital Social Care on behalf of NHS Digital. Um, and that's the fact that just throwing technology at services does not of itself work. We've actually got to think about what we're asking those services to use that technology for 
and help them actually do that. I can remember I two laptops turned up in my office uh, about two months ago that had been put in there by the CCG. Uh, and the staff had basically said, we don't know what to do with these, so they sent them to head office. Uh, that's not the way that we're actually going to get this technology up and working. The, one other thing that, that on the technological side that I think did work very well, possibly it shouldn't have done, but it did, and that's how did we get clinical support into the, into the homes in the first few weeks, months. And that was given in the main by a WhatsApp group supported by the British Geriatric Society. Now, if anything, to me, that has just proved that sharing and peer support uh, across providers who are very geographically and diverse can work. Um, there were hundreds of staff from care homes across the country on that WhatsApp group sharing information, sharing best practice, sharing what didn't work, uh, and surely we've got to make better use of that. The other point I, I reflect on is the fact that we've always got to look at the total system. I think you alluded to it in some of the previous presentations. Integration must not be dominated by the NHS. But how do we achieve that when politicians, public attitudes and funding are so, so tilted across to the NHS? This morning I was reading one document about uh, flu vaccine. And, and what's happened in previous years is we've taken the NHS model, put social care across the top and expected it to work. It, and it never does. It's got very lower take up in flu vaccine, for example, than, than this year and previous years. What we've got to accept is the NHS is a command and control system. And adult social care is a market. And, and therefore, we need to draw different ways of implementing these systems across those two bits. Then I reflect on the fact of the, we've had the tricky job of balancing national, regional and, and local involvement, where there's been considerable discussion about how we should manage that situation. And I use the examples of outbreak management in the last few weeks uh, to example that. Um, We've got to make sure that providers at all levels can actually uh, contribute towards that and understand what they're being expected to do. Uh, and I'd use the, the examples we've had of uh, visiting policies where a lot of providers were already opening up at least to some visits uh, before the official guidance came out last week. Um, or to medication reuse, which the policy came out months ago now, uh, yet I've still seen CCGs saying that they're piloting it. Uh, we needed it at the height of the pandemic, um, not, not now. Or we still need it now, but it's not the urgency. Um, I want to finish by just briefly talking about the, the first thing that the Minister talked about, and that's workforce. Um, we actually know that a large number of registered managers felt very isolated and alone during March and April and even into May. How many of them are going to stay in the sector and what else can we do to actually support them and make them feel valued and encourage them to continue in their role? The vast majority of those 1.6 million staff continued to come into work in a reliable way whilst continuing to be paid at national minimum wage. You know, and we haven't turned around and publicly enough, from my point of view, said thank you to them. Conversely, in the press this last week, I saw a restaurant receptionist's vacancy going up on, onto Indeed, on the website Indeed, and they got nearly a thousand applications inside 24 hours whereas our normal recruitment rate would be a handful, if that. So to me, we've got to do two things. We've got to change the image of the sector, which we've talked about for donkey's years, but we've never actually managed to do. And we've also got to stop insisting that people take time out from employment to actually work their way through the career, the career paths that are available to them. So actually getting a career path where people can stay in employment can in bite-sized chunks actually to undertake different qualifications and move across the, the combined health and care system, to me, is an absolute priority. Thanks a lot. 
Thank you very much indeed uh, for that, Ian, and reminding us what it was like five months ago, which to many of us, we really think is about five years ago, wasn't it? But it also reminds us that a lot of advances have been made, and it's absolutely vital that we work together now to make sure we don't lose them again. So let's all seize the moment, which of course is what the LGA and ADAS are trying to do with our publications today. So last but not least, one of the people who has to try and make sense of it all to keep us on the straight and narrow, uh, Debbie Ivanova from CQC. Thank you. I'll share my screen a moment and then I can start. Let's just get this onto the uh, slideshow. There we go. Thank you. So there is no doubt that this crisis has further highlighted, I think, both the resilience and the vulnerability of the adult social care sector. It's highlighted, though, the important place that social care has in the system. And that's particularly was evidenced in the, at the beginning by the initial demand for transfers out of hospital. And then during the rest of the crisis, the subsequent support that's been provided for people to stay at home. But this in turn has exposed the vulnerability of a care market with diverse settings and lack of easy access to some of the core requirements, for example, PPE and community uh, health staff and clinical support. The vulnerability that CQC talked about in our state of care report in 2016, where we described it as a tipping point, has been highlighted. Some of the other features that have really highlighted that, and, and I've got a few here, is a quarter of adult social care directors now have concerns about the financial sustainability of their providers. Our recent analysis of market oversight providers shows an overall reduction in admission to care homes. Although admissions funded by local authorities have now risen to an average of 72% of the number received in the same period in 2019, admissions for the week ending the 7th of June 2020 showed a huge range from 43% to 113% of the 2019 amount. Self-funded admissions by comparison range from only 25% to 51% of 2019 levels, with an average of only 35%. This clearly adds to the financial vulnerability of care homes. COVID has absolutely highlighted the vulnerability of people in our services. And, and I absolutely understand from Anna the, 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 the comment about not using those words around vulnerable people. But in this instance, I think this was, has shown us from the tragic number of deaths that has happened, that each of those lives is so important. Um, but when we look at them together, they result in a, in a real cumulative level of sadness and grief that our services have not encountered before. Uh, we need to make mo no mistake, this has had a profound effect, not just on families, but it's taken its toll on the resilience of staff who have held that relationship with families and comforted those at the end of their life, and some have this, lost their lives as well. COVID has also highlighted the complexities of the staffing situation in adult social care. There is both resilience and commitment in frontline staff, but real vulnerabilities in terms of numbers and skills. 34% of providers say they need more staff now. 9% of home care staff have been absent because of COVID. Sickness levels are now at 8% instead of 2.4%. That was 5.2 million extra days lost in March to June. No manager, a new manager, or any sort of change in management during COVID has been really shown to be a risk factor in the work that we've done. So it's remarkable that social care has weathered the storm in the way that it has, given the magnification of the challenges. However, it is very fragile and still no long-term sustainable funding solution. The three points I want to make on lessons to be learned. Focusing rightly on people, what is all of this in addition to the overall death toll, it has highlighted inequality in the system. And I was pleased to hear Anna talking about this. I'll probably recognize the diverse people. We must rise to the challenge and think on about how we run to black, gen and minority people in our, those with disability, complex and challenging behavior. Have first 
comprehensively met. I think it's also shown us for people that have moved towards a more directive model with some centralized policies and procedures where we rightly focus on keeping people safe can lead to a one-size-fits-all approach where people lose those things that matter most to them. The essential choices within care and the respect of people's human rights needs even closer attention and becomes a careful balancing act. The think local, act personal, making it real statements are more important than ever right now. Secondly, partnership. COVID, ha COVID has shown the health and social care system to recognise the equal worth of each part, that we can only achieve a safe and comprehensive health and social care service that meets people's needs by working together. This partnership working must have a system focus beyond traditional boundaries, and I've heard other people mention this already today, reaching into public health and encompassing a focus on commissioning innovative services. A move from competition to collaboration needs to be seen as it was seen during COVID, it also needs to be maintained and expanded as we move forward. And thirdly, pathways. COVID clearly illustrate, is illustrated what can happen when pathways are disrupted. Access to health services in the community and hospital services has had significant impact on people using adult social care services. We need to make sure those pathways are responsive and secure for people across every local area. So the way forward in CQC and what this means in terms of changing our approach to regulation started with a move to a different way of working in recognition of the severe pressures in the system. So we moved from a focus on regulation to relationships. Inspectors provided support alongside continual monitoring whilst not uh, taking away the um, ability to take action when risks were identified. We've been in contact with approximately 20,400 services between the 17th of March and the 31st of May. That's about 82% of the registered market. We then introduced the Emergency Support Framework, a specific tool to look at how services are managing during this time. 40% of services have now had that ESF. Managers have told us they value this contact and the support offered has helped them to ensure they're maintaining a safe environment. We have also, though, continued to inspect. 115 inspections have now taken place and nearly 200 are planned for August. We have found some really worrying things. We have found cultures that have become completely closed, management of IPC that is lacking, poor administration of medication, failure to identify and respond appropriately to changes in people's health needs, failure to manage end of life care needs and inappropriate use of restraint but that is really small numbers compared to those services that we have found to be managing well. We really want to make sure we hear the voice of people who use social care and their families. And so with Healthwatch introduced the Because We All Care campaign to support and encourage more people to feed back on services they or a loved one have experienced. The campaign launched on the 8th of July and runs for four weeks. We've also introduced provider collaborative reviews and hopefully you've seen a bit of our, our publicity around this. At the moment covering only 11 areas, still 3 million people will be um, covered by those 11 areas. And the aim is to find out how providers have worked collaboratively to meet the challenges posed by COVID with a review focusing on an ISC or SDP area identifying themes and learning that can be used to inform planning for the coming winter. The intention is to help providers and leaders of local health and care systems to plan and work more effectively together. Next, we're moving into a transitional methodology, but immediately, well, in August, we're going to start some infection and prevention and control inspections in adult social, social care. Every inspection that we do will look at infection prevention and control, but in addition, we'll inspect a sample of 300 care homes where we don't have concerns about risk, including where outbreaks haven't occurred, to understand how IPC may have a positive, positive influence, and we'll look at how we can share that good practice. And that will happen in both September and November in our, our independent voice products. The methodology that's being developed in September will be more flexible and responsive in the way we regulate. People will continue to be at the centre of what we do and we're looking at how many imaginative and uh, comprehensive ways we can include people in those inspections. But um, making sure that we only ass assess the aspects of care that we need to, being clear on the scope of our assessment and, the, and being proportionate to the risks presented. Where appropriate, we'll do some of that remotely, but 
um, site visits will still occur, but the, pa the amount of time spent on time will be kept to a minimum. In the future, we're starting to think about developing our new strategy from mid-2021, and our four pillars will be focused on meeting people's needs with a focus really on in innovation and improvement, smarter regulation, making sure we share good practice, data and resources, and using a research and evidence-based approach. Promoting safe care for people, this continues to be our focus. And alongside all of these, driving and supporting improvement, speaking up where improvement is most needed, and collaborating to achieve change, expecting good providers to drive those changes. How we intend to reset is this way and not restart. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that. I, the, the phrase I liked most in what you said, I liked a lot of it, was uh, remarkable that the social care service has stood up so well, despite all the pressures that you rightly indicated to us, Debbie. And, and also perhaps I welcome the fact that you're quickly adapting your inspection regimes to meet these very pressing uh, needs. Now we have started to get some questions in, so please put them on to the Q&A. So I'm going to ask the first one. And so we're not all muting and unmuting uh, and we don't get confused. I'm going to ask you to respond to them if you want to in the same order that you've spoken. Uh, and one of those uh, actually in, in a way comes from what uh, uh, we've just been told by Debbie. Um, one of our principles that we've been enunciating here and which was supported by ADAS was the principle of local pulling people together at a meaningful and local level. But how does that square with NHSE, NHSI's view of trying to do some things by STP geography? And to show you how daft that is, our STP goes from Southport to Crewe. Why anyone would go from Southport to Crewe, I don't know, but that's the scale of it. People don't and so what we're trying to do is do things in Southport and Crewe and all the places in between. Can I have your thoughts on that, starting with Anna? Unmute. Yeah. I don't it. really have anything specific on that, so I'll pass on to the next. Right, thank you. James? I certainly recognise the dilemma, and one of the lessons of um, COVID has been often we've overwritten local intelligence and local ways of working with an approach that is either national or, or sometimes regional so it's imperative that we go with a default position of as local as you can be um, but this the second way of looking at this question is what is what is your local system what does it consist of when you're thinking about how organizations work together um, this isn't right for thinking about people but when you're thinking about how health care and housing and the voluntary sector work together whatever is your local system it has got to be the starting point now that might be an SDP level if it's if that's small enough but often it isn't often the SDPs or the ICS levels are quite large they're populations of nearly a million oftentimes um, and so that's too big actually and one way of busting through all of that I think for the future is to think about this notion of primary care networks population levels of about 30,000 I mean even people in the voluntary sector would say well that's already too huge stop it that's not that's not neighborhood working but but it's a it's a reasonable number around which you can get GPs people using services social workers and nurses and occupational therapists and housing officers all together to think about their population needs and I really do think primary care networks need to be given a chance to be perhaps the starting point around which we uh, carry out integrated working but um, all of that though has got to come down to an individual and place means something to people where you live that's that's got to be the mentality and the lens through which you look and of course not forgetting councillors who are elected on a place based, you know, in a, in a, in a ward or a, or a um, electoral division. So you, you really got to have that chunking up um, 
So I don't mind if they get big to a million, as long as they chunk up in the right nested sort of way, if that's, uh, if that's a metaphor. Yeah, that's very helpful. You do the right thing at the right level. Sometimes you need big, sometimes you need small. As long as you do the right thing at the right level, perhaps it doesn't matter too much. That's for us to uh, sort out. Uh, Ian? I'd build on what James had just said. I think that, that, that there are examples certainly that I know of where an STP is far too large an area to actually apply a consistent thing. Um, but I also picked up from a colleague um, the other day that, who said that we need to set a national framework in which localities can, can, can succeed. Yeah, and I thought that was, was quite a nice way of actually blending the two. You've got to, in other words, we've got to have an overall policy direction, but then locally you've got to be able to, to actually manage within whatever services are available in a particular geographic area. Uh, and, and meld those together to address the needs of that individual population. Yeah, so where top down meets bottom up is our shorthand for that. Absolutely. De Debbie, how are you going to overlook these differing levels for different things? Well, I think for us, it is looking at both the systems and then looking at the individual services. And I don't think you can do one without the other. And I think just the only thing adding on top of what other people have said is that if we really focus on what people want and what people need from their services that should enable us to get that real bottom-up influence and that local picture and I, I think the challenge for local authorities is to make sure that uh, they're always at the table and always represented because I go to a lot of meetings where that's not always the case and it does vary between different areas and if we want to be part of the solution we've got to really be part of the, the discussions that are going on. Thank you. So we move now to another question uh, what do you think the key drivers are for us to track? And it's just as well you're last on this, Debbie, because it probably leads to you. Uh, what do we need to track to ensure that we are not having this conversation again about the remoteness, about the failure to, to bring together the lack of esteem, perhaps, between uh, in, in the system so that we do, once and for all, get to grips with the main problem? What are the key things? And Anna, what, how would you judge that on a very personal basis, as well as the big picture stuff? Sorry, can I just clarify? So are you talking about the, the problem of the parity of esteem? Well, uh, we, we've had a series of problems presented <laughs> okay. to us, of which parity of esteem is one. Okay. But we could have had this conversation five or ten years ago and had exactly the same discussion about the problems, whatever they are. Okay. I think for me, one of the things that um, we need to track or record or quantify in some way would be actual people's experiences. So when I see social care data, um, it often has a lot of numbers and a lot of how many people receive this, how many people receive that, how many people there, here and everywhere. Um, and actually for me, I don't think we can um, quantify how well the system is doing without actually asking people who um, use the system, asking their carers and their family, and also asking the people that work in it. I think yeah. we need some more of that qualitative data, um, which I guess I understand is hard to get. Well, no, it's not hard to get, but hard to then um, work from. But actually, I think it's much more valuable and um, we need to make sure we're getting enough of that and we need to make sure people feel safe and comfortable to give their honest views and their ideas as well because I think they have a role to play. Thank you. James? I think it's a, it's a hard question to ask this isn't it but um, my starting point would be I very much agree with what Anna has just said about um, asking people and so that you get a kind of qualitative answer to to, um, have we have we dealt with the problems and are, are people living well? I would track. I would. I would. But in terms of metrics and um, things like that, I would track the number of people who are directing their own care, whether it's through a personal budget or other mechanism. I think we need a significant increase in that. We, we've never really given it um, proper justice because the Care Act was introduced at a time of austerity. Um, I would. I would track the workforce and the number of people working in care so that you've actually got choice 
Um, very many people don't really get a choice. They're just told that's the care available in your area. I think I'd track housing as well so that um, housing becomes a realistic alternative to residential or supported living or nursing care. So, um, you know, numbers of new houses built that are to a proper care standard, um, for example. Um, and then I reckon I would, I think we've still got a quality problem. We've still got 20% of all care is either inadequate or needs uh, improvement. And whatever you, whatever you might say about how that's measured and whether you're measuring it from people, you, you've got to be able to track an improvement in that, it seems to me, over time. It seems to be improving far too slowly. So I, I would start with those four, actually. Thank you. That's very modest, James. <laughs> Ian? I'd put two things up. One is, does do we as providers actually understand what is important to that individual in their lives? Mm. Yeah, uh, and, and that's one thing that we try and make sure in my services, we know and keep that at the front of our minds. Um, but the, the other thing, looking at the, the overall system, and I think CQC are doing that with some of these system reviews, is that my very first inspection was by the guy who was actually the chief exec of the health authority, as it was called in those days. And he used to ask me three questions about each person. Firstly, what was the acute provider doing for that person? What was the GP doing for that person? And what was I doing for that person? Yeah, uh, and that stuck with me across nearly 40 years now, as in terms of, you know, that was getting, he, in those days, he funded all three because he was funding the GPs and the acute providers. So he wanted to know what the system was doing overall. And I think what, what CQC have been doing over the last couple of years to do those system reviews is very helpful. Thank you. And Debbie, you're now going to be the housing inspectorate as well, by the sound of it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think that's on the cards right now. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I do hope that, that some of the momentum that's built up during this time will continue to make a difference because I do think conversations have changed. Certainly the conversations I've been in have been very different um, over the last few months. And I do think that um, if we start with the individual, if we start with the stories, if we continue to keep up the momentum around what difference this has really made to people. That puts us in a really strong place. People, the public out there now know about adult social care. And the more we keep those stories real and alive for people, the more chance I think we have of making those changes uh, uh, last. Then I think we have to really look at the pathway because if you focus on the pathway, that's what will get us the right level of equal um, uh, partnership within the system and the system being recognized properly because the minute you disrupt a pathway that's where the care goes wrong and if we can make that really clear and we can speak bravely about where there are those gaps and where things aren't working in a really open way with health between different parts of adult social care between um, private and fee paying across across the board really that's the way we're going to get to the solutions that are going to make a difference in the future. Thank you very much. And uh, the final question we've got time for brings us back to the people who make it work. Uh, and that's our workforce. So if you were to just take for granted, in a way, the fact that we need more money and we need to pay people better, what are the things that you see would bring a strong, healthy workforce to meet the needs that we've all described? Anna. Um, so I have, I suppose, a slightly um, niche view on workforce in the sense that I employ PAs. So yeah. um, I've suddenly found myself being an employer, having never been that before in my life. Um, and I think for me, what I've found is that actually some of my best PAs have never worked in social care before and probably never would have considered it before. Um, and so I think we need some sort of way of making it more attractive to other people. But but I I think the kind of campaigns that we often see are like sort of the wrinkly hands effect and the, the sort of often focus on that, that sort of what the public view as social care, which is often care homes. And obviously that's important that people work in those care homes as well. But I think somehow showing people that it's a much broader role and that actually if we are about 
giving people choice and control and, and good lives. I think people could get on board with that. I suppose for me, really, there's something about offering people genuine career progression. I think that's been a problem for me. You know, my PAs have nowhere to move on and up to. So eventually they move on to some other sector completely. None of my PAs have stayed, who've left, have stayed within social care. And that's a real shame because they've, they've been brilliant. And so I think there is real need for that. Thank you. Thank you. An important niche, though, but probably with uh, other aspects to be heard across the whole sector. James. Uh, thank you. So I would like to see um, almost like an industry level strategy for care, uh, actually. I think that um, care is bigger than uh, fisheries. It's bigger than agriculture. It's bigger than tourism, actually. Um, we are £16 billion and we really should be, I don't know, £24 billion, perhaps, if, I, if, I, if we got what, what we would wish for in this year. Um, so our challenge is to grow, isn't it? And uh, compared with, say, the oil industry, whose challenge is to shrink and shrink the number of jobs. So we've got we've got to think about it from an economics point of view, and that is one dimension that will help bring the workforce in. If we are just systematically expanding and uh, work, working at that level, but to bring it down to um, the, the workforce itself, I very much agree that we need to structure careers for progression. And it's not just about wages, it's about what am I doing with my working life, actually. And we don't have that in social care. And I, I don't feel that the 18,000 providers, the highly distributed model that we've got lends itself. Um, we've got to spend more on that. We, I think the average spend on care worker is about £140 a year for its for training, compared with £1,400 a year for the NHS. You know, it's just... Sim simple uh, improvement at that level needs to take place. Then I think we need to think about flexibility of working lives. The world has changed and care jobs have got to reflect that flexibility. And at one level, we've got that because we've got many vacancies and a high level of turnover, but we need to cure that problem, but not make the job so rigid so that people can't live lives in them. And then finally, I think we do need to change the image. I think we need to attract more men, for example, into uh, care delivery. I, I don't want to, you know, I don't have the queue for coffee at the moment, particularly at the moment, but I don't mind, I don't mind halving the number of uh, baristas if we can get that population to be retrained to work in the care sector, from retail to care, as long as you've got the right values, that's what we should be aiming for, really, a shift in our economy towards care right a principled attack on baristas no that was overstating it <laughs> ian the the main comment i've got is is I, I mentioned as i was speaking i think recruiting for values is absolutely fundamental mm. uh, I, I know that that some of the people that we've hired can be what what i'd describe as raving extroverts uh, and they can make a phenomenal difference inside a, a service to actually improve the quality of life because they've, if they've got some life themselves. So recruiting the right people, not necessarily because they've got the experience or the, yeah, and they might need training, but recruiting for values is fundamental to me. And then the, the point that I, I, I talked through earlier, allowing people those career progressions without having to leave work is what an awful lot of people will respond to. But for one reason or another, we've got structures that actually stop us doing that. So it might be clinical support that they want to go, get into and, and, and take more clinical responsibility, you know, looking after people and doing wound care, that sort of thing, is something we've tried and tried and tried to do over the years and we've never made, made it happen. Uh, but integrated working, to me, across district nurses and residential care is something that there's massive amounts of scope and massive amounts of system efficiencies if we can get it right besides enhancing the career prospects and the role that those individuals are performing thank you and debbie i think my colleagues have, have made all the most points but i just will say finally that almost 40 years ago i entered the care industry as an assistant and i knew right from the beginning that i wanted that to be my career and i think that's where we need to really pitch things we need to pitch it at 
getting people who really want a career in social work to understand how amazing it can be and really selling it as a, as a great um, opportunity to have a really interesting and exciting career. Excellent, thank you. Well, that's uh, unfortunately all we've uh, got time for. It's been, for me, a very fascinating uh, event. We heard from the Minister an understanding that more money is required, though she was obviously reluctant to say where that might come from. Uh, and we did hear a very important uh, recognition from her that we need to have a parity of esteem between the NHS and social care. Though I must say that isn't what I heard in the salary announcements last week, which seem to ignore social care altogether. We heard from Anna the importance of putting the people we serve right at the heart of this as the decision makers, the people who live the experience and can inform as best of what they want. Uh, we heard from James just the importance that has that the public are seeing now in a way they haven't done before, the importance of social work and crucially the importance of social workers. This is no longer these Claire in the community stuff which I find amusing uh, but not representative of the people who come into public and private sector places to work from us. We heard from Ian that this is now the time to strike and that integration must be a fig leaf imposed on everyone else by the NHS but it must be an integration of equals coming together and we heard from Debbie how the CQC is adapting and has adapted very quickly its methodologies what it'll be looking for what it'll be reporting on and what it will be advising on to help us who deliver the services, deliver our work better from that pool of knowledge that CQC can bring to us. So thank you to all who've uh, contributed to this. Thank you to the 200 people who at its peak were participating. If you do want to come to Liverpool, I will do the Penny Lane walk with you personally. Uh, but you might have to call one or two of the bars on Penny Lane and Allerton Road just to help our local economy and be sociable. So one day we'll see you in Penny Lane, if not more likely back at an LGA event. Thank you all for your support and attendance today. <laughs>